everyone, good the morning. Welcome to the second edition of Gardening with Edibles Masterclass Series. My name is Vicky. Today, I'll be talking about eggplants, tomatoes, and lady's finger. Now, NPARKS has given out free packets of seeds due to Gardening with Edibles initiative in June. So, if you have started and sow your seeds, and manage to harvest, congratulations, okay? But if you haven't, don't be sad, don't be disappointed because the topics that we are discussing today might be the issues that you are facing right now. At the end of this webinar, we're going to have a short Q&A portion. So, and you have, if you have some questions that you would like to ask, do upvote so that uh, if you want to see them answered. Um, due to li limited time, okay, I really hope that you guys can actually keep to the topics discussed today. All right, thank you very much. Now, a brief introduction of today's plants that we are showing today. Um, Lady's finger actually belongs to this family known as Mava Vesi. Other plants, that also belongs to this family, which you might be familiar of, would include like hibiscus, cotton, and Singapore's favorite fruit. Yeah, you guess it, durian. You'd be surprised, right? It's actually the same family as the lady's finger. Next, we have the eggplants and the uh, tomatoes. They might not look the same or within the same family, but they are, okay? They belong to the same family known as Solar Nasi. And other plants that also belong to this family uh, would include potato, chilies. And recently, during my trip to the local supermarket, I encountered this special fruit that it also belongs to the Solar Nasi family too. Has anyone? Has any idea what is this? Okay, answer revealed. This is known as pepino melon. Okay, you can eat this raw like any other fruits. It smells a bit nice and fragrant too. Okay, and it can taste, how it tastes? It tastes quite refreshing and resemble um, honeydew in fact. And when you cut this open, it actually resembles a cross-section of a pear. So it looks like a melon from far too. That is why sometimes we also call this melon pear. And it comes with a Chinese name, which some of you might own oh, when I actually revealed the answer. It's actually known as Ren Shen Guo. Does it ring a bell? Okay, now this only um, appears seasonally in a supermarket. So if you really do see and you would like to try yourself, go ahead, okay? It's quite nice and interesting, okay? Now, I have a few cultivars that I would like to showcase to you guys. Um, cultivars which I have been propagating or cultivating in our nursery, in our Pasibanjang nursery, okay? They actually arrange a diversity of sizes, shapes, and colors. So let's start with the eight plants, shall we? Okay, over here I have a plate of some of the examples of the eight plants. Now this is the common ones that you've seen commonly sold in our wet markets, in our supermarkets, right? This is the brinjal or eight plants. It actually comes with a lot of names. can also call abergins too, okay? Uh, how do you cook it? I'm sure I don't have to tell you guys, right? Because you are much better off than me. Okay, the next one that I'm going to show is this tiny little thing. Okay, can you all see this? Okay, this is known as the turkey berry. Widely used in cuisines such as the Thai green curry. Okay. And uh, it's also used in also um, other curries, in Indian curries as well. And because of the small size, look at this, very small. Okay, 
it is also called P berries, like a P from far. Okay. Next off, I have a photo um, attached. Now this is actually known as the bitter tomato. Bitter tomato, yes, can be eaten raw too. And it tastes like tomato, but of course it's not a tomato. Um, that is why bitter tomato, also called mock tomato. And when you taste this, it actually tastes a bit slightly bitter, but of course cannot compare with our normal bitter gourd taste. Okay? And bitter tomato can also be used in stews and as well as enhancing the um, curries too. Quite a lot of curries, yeah? Now the next one I'm going to show is this cute, hairy little ball thing known as Coco Nila. Okay? Coco Nila, on the surface, if you look at it carefully, is prickly. So yes, the answer is we cannot eat directly like this. What do we do? We just cut half, extract, the fresh inside, and you, yes, you can eat it raw from there. Okay, and it tastes um, like uh, sweet and sour uh, fish, that kind. Okay, sweet and sour. And sometimes my friend actually used this to enhance their curry too, as a kind of condiment. Okay, so you can try it out. Because, and all those fruits, you can actually find them um, sometimes seasonally at our local markets as well as ethnic markets. So do go and try and find out. Okay, next, let's move on to one of my favorite. Da -da, the lady's finger. Looks like my finger. Okay, now, lady's finger, over here I have assorted colors. First off, okay, I have this one known as the Greeny Splendor. No, this is not the normal one that we've seen in our local markets. The one that we've seen in the local market actually looks like this. Can you tell the difference? Yeah? Some of you might have guessed it, yes. If you notice the surface over here is smooth. Okay? Whereas for the one over here, the local ones, it actually has riches as I turn around. So, can you guess the, feature, the, the difference? Okay. Next off, I want to show is this silver looking, whitish looking lady's finger. No, this is not because of nutrient deficiency or lack of photosynthesis. This is the natural color. That is why it is called silver queen. And these are actually quite renowned for its uh, flavor and, and, and fibrous texture. The next one is the red one, known as the red burgundy. Okay, all this that I mentioned can be eaten raw and they all have the fibrous mucus thing. So you can use this and eat it as a, say, salad. Okay. Now, there's one thing of, of this, my favorite. Ta da! What does it look to you like? Small, fat looking finger like my thumb. Okay? And uh, it has a lot of riches. All right? Let me cut open and show you what it resembles. At. I have the young one here. You do know how to choose um, a correct young lady's finger, right? When it actually bend, and that is, yes, is quite young and able to eat. Now, let me cut this. Okay. Can you see the age of this plant, the lady's finger? What does it remind you of? The star of David. So this is why this cultivar name has this interesting name called Star of David. It's like a star shining. Just nice, right? We, um, Christmas is around the corner. Mm -hmm. So you know what to do. Okay? Right. And you can eat this raw too. Smells nice also. Okay, enough of the lady's finger. 
Now we move on to the tomatoes. Now tomatoes, over here I have, yes, the cherries, tomatoes here. Okay, these are the normal ones that we always see in sell in the you know, local commercial nurseries. Okay, it ranges in size. Of course, this is much bigger one. All right. Then we have the other one that is shown in the photo. Um, because my existing one is actually green. So this photo actually shows the right one, known as the mamande. It's a kind of beefsteak tomato. Now, beefsteak is actually one of the largest tomato varieties. Okay? In fact, it can grow so big, as big as my palm. Okay? The diameter. And in the World Guinness Record, um, latest one in 20, year 2019, the heaviest one actually weighs around 4.3 kg. That heavy. Imagine that. Okay? Now we jump from the heavyweight one to the lightweight one. We have on my left here, this compact, cute little tomato known as Vilma. Okay? And it has a very nice Chinese name too, known as Fan Chie Xiao Mei Re. Okay? It's cute. And uh, it's good for container gardening, if you would like to consider that. And the berries or the, uh, the tomatoes are actually this small. And at its prime, you can see it growing a whole plant, the whole plant of it, whole part of the plant. Okay? And you can harvest it. It tastes very sweet too and crunchy. Now the other one I have is the even compact version than this Vilma, known as Micro Tom or Micro Tomato for short. Okay, why is it called Micro Tomato? Besides the size of the leaf, as you can compare, it's smaller, much much smaller. Okay, the fruit itself is also small. But don't belittle them, don't look down on these tomatoes, even though they are small. Whole bunch of goodness of flavor is all packed inside here. Okay? See how small it is? And this only weighs about not more than 15 grams. Cute, right? I also find them too. Okay. Enough of showing the, the cultivars. I'm sure you will be asking me this question. And how do I actually grow them so well? Ah? Well, it's actually very simple. Let me share with you some of the tips, okay? These plants are actually very simple creatures. They just need four main factors. If you manage to keep to these four factors, you too can actually have a happy plant in your garden. First off, of course, is the sun. Sun is very important. Now, Today's plants that we are showing today actually requires a minimum of direct exposure of four hours of sun. Now, you might wonder, what do I mean by direct sun exposure? Now, I have a simple illustration. Okay, you can see, right, this is a paper that was being un put under the table lamp. Okay, imagine the paper is the plant. And the table lamp is the sun. Okay? So when I mean by direct sunlight, means the plant is actually under direct exposure to the sun for a minimum of four hours. Minimum. But if you can give it more, even happier. Okay? The more the man. Alright? Then the next one, sometimes you will hear us saying either partial shade or partial sun. They actually mean the same thing. Okay, so it's either morning sun or afternoon sun with like dappled, like you know, the plant is actually under the say the canopy of a tree, for instance. All right, and the uh, number of hours of sun exposure will not exceed more than four hours, it's between two to four hours. Now, that is what we call partial shade or partial sun. Okay. Now the next one, or the last one, is actually the full shade. Basically, you can see that it's very dark, right? Yeah, not much sunlight, in fact. 
If you can, you have to say it will be probably about 30 minutes, but not more than one hour of sun exposure. Okay, so this type of plants normally will apply to, say, indoor plants, where just simple, a little bit of filter light from the windowsill would actually make them happy. But for today, the plants that we are having, the eight plants, the lady's finger, the tomatoes, belongs to this category of the direct sun exposure. So I hope that this makes it clear. Okay, all right. The next is the soil. All right, soil is basically the foundation, the basic foundation of the plant. The root system of this plant actually spend almost all their lifetime inside the soil. So soil is very, very important. Second important, in fact. Okay, and important thing is not just any other soil. It must be well-drained and fertile. Now, what do we mean by well-drained? It means that when I water the plant, after the plant managed, the roots actually managed to absorb the water that it needed, excess water will drain out from the drainage holes on the pots or the bed that you actually grow them in. Okay, it is never waterlogged. Now this is important because if the roots of the plant or the feet, we call it, is, is under prolonged exposure to water, then you will cause a lot of issues like root rot. And when that happens, well, I'm so sad, you can say bye-bye to your plant. Okay, now the next factor that you need to remember is the water. Now, watering is very important, of course. In fact, the amount of water needed by the plant ranges when it's actually in the juvenile stage to the adult form. As it grows bigger, much more and more water will be required to water the plants. Okay, now what I mean by juvenile stage. This is the juvenile form of the plant. Okay, so this kind of plant, watering once a day is good enough. But this kind of big leaf, adult form of plant, will require probably at least twice, okay? And when we water, do be mindful that we need to water them, try to water them in the morning, where evaporation rate is actually low. So when we water, the plants will have the time to actually absorb the needed water before it is evaporated eventually. Try not to water in either the midday or at night because the midday means under hot sun, evaporation rate will be high, right? And when you water, much water is lost due to evaporation. It's not being absorbed by the plant much. The plant doesn't have enough time to absorb in fat. So that's why sometimes do you wonder that when you water in the midday, the plant still remain droopy looking? Yeah, that could be the reason. Okay, now at night is also not recommended because you will actually um, lead to other issues like fungal, which I will talk about it more later on. Okay, clear? Now, the next one, or rather the last factor that I'm going to talk about is fertilizer. Now, plants also need food, just like human beings. Okay, if you want to harvest or run the ensure bountiful harvest, make sure that you also feed the plant. We cannot be taking from the plant without giving them back, right? So by giving them is in terms of the food. Plants will reward you bountifully. Okay, and uh, if you go to the nurseries, you might and buy the packet of fertilizer. You might notice that the initials known as N, P, K. And sometimes it has another initial called T, E. Now what does that mean? N stands for nitrogen. Important for the leaf development and chlorophyll production. P and K stands for phosphorus and potassium respectively. Okay, they are very important for the roots development, the flower and the fruits development. 
OK? And last one, which uh, TE stands for trace elements, which means it actually have a little bit of micronutrients that is needed by the plant as like a, like a supplementary. OK? Now, as the plant is from the juvenile stage, which you, I have shown just now, this one, all right, it requires a balanced fertilizer first. What I mean by balance? It means the NPK ratio is all almost the same. Okay, one is to one is to one. So that the plants will have enough rather than too biased towards one side. Because they are still young, ma. Okay, but as a plant grows bigger, all right, and taller, they will require a higher percent, uh, percentage or ratio of phosphorus and potassium so that they can develop the flowers and the fruits because they are mature already. Okay, they can, they can tahan, they can eat the higher end one. Okay, so you might wonder how is it that why my plant actually have a lot of leaves or green in this case? That could be the reason you'll be continuing applying a lot of nitrogen, in fact. Okay? So start to switch when you feel that you want them to start flowering. Okay? So remember these four factors. The sun, the soil, the water, and the fertilizer. You manage them, you will be able to let your plants grow happily ever after. Simple, right? I told you. Okay? Now, we have to start somewhere, you know, where with all these plants, we can't, it, it just can't come out from its own. So, fortunately, all these plants can be propagated or can be grown from seeds. Okay, tomatoes can grow from seeds, um, lady's finger can also grow from seeds, all these are easy. And where do you get the seeds from? Okay, you can get these seeds easily from the local commercial nurseries or from a reputable seed sources, okay? Um, and another thing is, if you already own a plant already, okay, you might want to consider stretching your dollar sign by allowing a couple of fruit to mature to a very ripe, very ripe form, okay? Green jaw and tomatoes, just allow it to ripe, so that you can actually harvest the seeds. Now, ladies' finger, you can actually harvest such as this stage. Okay, it appears brownish. Yeah, it doesn't look appealing. Yeah, I know. But what is important is that you wanted to harvest this kind of seed pods, so that when you pry open, okay, such as this, okay, you will actually generate this seeds that you can see here, black one. Okay, these are the mature seed pods. As compared to the one that earlier on I have cut. Can you see the difference? Yes. Uh, very mature form versus a very young uh, seed pods. So if you want to harvest a seed and you harvest this type, the green immature seeds, I, sorry, I will have to say that your germination rate will be close to zero because these are not mature enough to germinate into the next generation. Now, whereas this kind is the right ones, so you can continue to you know, grow for the next generation. So I hope that is clear. Okay. Now, tomatoes, I got to take this opportunity to emphasize on this tomato because it's actually a very special one. Now, Ladies' finger and bring jaws um, can only be propagated by seeds. However, for tomatoes, it can propagate two ways. One, stem cutting, and two, of course, seeds all, right? Now, for those of you guys who actually um, grow tomatoes at home, do you notice something that is happening on your plant, the tomato plant? Yeah, okay. Area roots. Now, in my photos here, I have attached, you will see two types of uh, area roots. One appearing at the base, and the other appear on the stem. Now, the one on the base is, you can take advantage by topping up with a fresh 
supply of well-drained fertile soil. Yes, we were taught, right? Yes, we are known. We were taught not to backfill with soil because this will suffocate the plant. But this is not the case for tomatoes. Okay, so if you want to, that's, that's why you need to bear in mind that if you grow the tomatoes in a pot, you might want to choose a deep pot uh, with de much depth so that you can actually continue to top up. Now, the stems, uh, the area roots that's happening on the stems, I'm definitely not asking you to top up all the way until the stem. No, that's not the way. Okay? Now, why not take advantage of this small little area roots happening on the stem to do a stem cutting? Now, earlier on, using the same plant, I have immersed this cutting in a glass of water. And one week later, ta -da! look at the gorgeous, nice looking roots. It's massive. Okay? And uh, you can see that this is exactly the same plant as the photo show. Okay? So at this stage, you can choose either to transplant this seedling or cutting, sorry, this cutting to a pot of another new fresh pot of uh, well drained fertile soil. Or you might want to consider planting this at the hydro, in a hydroponic system. Now, for more information on growing hydroponically, um, do look up in our FB live show that was being um, uploaded in the SG YouTube channel. Okay, that was carried out, that was done by Dr. Wilson Wong and me. Okay, a little bit of advertisement. Haha. <laughs> okay, so that's a sight. Now, let's talk about tomato seeds. Okay, tomato seeds are divided between determinate and indeterminate. Wow, what is this words, man? Don't think, right? Nah, it's actually very simple. Now, if you actually notice when you buy seed packs, tomato seed packs, okay, flip the labels and you might see something called determinate, as you can see from the photo. Okay, so if it mentioned determinate, chances are you will actually get this kind of bushy, compact form of tomato varieties like the Vilma and the micro tome earlier shown. Okay, that was shown earlier. They will only grow to this height. They will not be in a vine like, like we always seen. Okay, and the fruits will uh, just appear all at one time. And after one or two harvests, then the plant will slowly, slowly deteriorate and it will stop growing already. Because the annuals, ma. Okay, Determ indeterminate are the ones that we always seen in the commercial nurseries, which is like this one, the vine light tomatoes. Okay, they grow as high as they can, as much as high as possible whenever the support is. Now, talking about support, just want to mention, specially mention that tomatoes actually are weak vine. Okay, so they cannot support by themselves if we do not create the staking. Okay, so if you want to know more about staking, again, do look up in our gardening resources and the YouTube channel. Okay, um, yes, and tomatoes for the vining tomatoes, okay, they, some packets will actually, seed packs will actually indicate how high you need to allow these vining tomatoes to grow before they can start to set flowers and fruits. Okay, do look up. But generally, okay, generally, this tomato binding tomatoes have to go to a height of between 1.5 to about 2 meter before they are allowed to set flowers and fruits. Like you can see here, is my height about 1.5. Okay, they already start fruiting already. So you might wonder sometimes why is it that your tomatoes steam fruit at all? Is it because you don't allow it to grow higher? That could be the reason. Okay, now, after sharing all those things, the propagation part and all that, let me also share a little bit of tips to actually take good care of them. Okay, now, let's talk about watering first. You actually realize that I emphasize a lot of watering, right? 
Yeah, because watering is very, very important. Ma. We you know as we grow bigger, you cannot actually uh, ignore the fact that you don't water. They need a lot of water. So, but, but right now, I actually wanted to point out that I have seen some gardeners, okay, um, like to somehow have a tendency of bathing the entire plant, okay? It makes them feel good because somehow they think that the leaves get water, they will grow faster. The stem grow, um, have water, they will grow faster. <sighs> I'm sorry, okay, if that doesn't happen, okay? If you allow the water to be exposed in, you know, the, on the leaves for a long period of time, fungal issues will start to happen. Now, what kind of fungal issues do I mean? Now, I have some photos for illustration. Now, here are some of the spots that you can see. Do they look familiar to you? Black spots appearing on the lower leaves, black spot appearing on the upper leaves of the lady finger. And you can also see yellow spots appearing on the brain jaw leaf, in fact. Now, these are all because of incorrect watering techniques. Then, what can we do? Of course, just very simple. Just concentrate your watering at the base. We'll do already. Very easy, right? Yes. Don't water the whole entire plant. So meanwhile, what can I do with the spot spots leaves? Cut them away. Lor. Yeah, simple. Okay. Now, um, since we are talking about watering, okay, let me ask a question to you guys. Let me pose a question first. Tomatoes is suffering from something. Can you notice the crack here? Yes. So can I have a poll um, as to how many of you actually have the same experience as me? Just a simple yes or no. All right. And let me know whether you actually experience that. Okay, I can see the results now. Yes, it's about 50%. Okay, yes, it's about 50%. Now, do you know why it actually happens? It's also to do with watering issues. Okay, now sometimes because we are busy, ma, we don't water enough or we forgot to water. So, when, especially when these plants actually have fruits ready, all right, then... Uh, you know, you forgot the water, so the fresh inside, the fruits actually contracted. Then all of a sudden, you talk of, ah yeah, I forgot the water, I better go and water now. So guilty, add more now, okay, more than it can actually uh, handle. So the flesh inside will expand faster than the protective skin outside. So when this happens, you will get your cracks. Okay. You will ask me, can this be eaten or not? Can. It's just that your shelf life will be much shorter as compared to the complete fruit. Okay? Um, then how do we prevent this? All you need to do is just to apply a layer of organic matter, such as compost. Now this will actually retain the moisture for a while, enough for you to remember to water the plant. Okay? So remember that. Okay, so um, with the watering and the cracks, now let's move on to pruning. Now, again, I noticed that a lot of people also tend to prune um, not so correctly. Okay, over here, I have some examples of uh, incorrect pruning of a lady's finger. You will see um, some frays here. 
And then, of course, the one that the stem below is actually quite long, the petiole, sorry, the petiole of the leaf is actually allowed to, to cut too long. Okay, now this tool is caused by, this one is actually caused by blunt cutter or secateur. And this one is, we don't dare to prune too near to the node. I do hope that you guys know what's a node, right? Okay, so leaving this long petiole stem, okay? This two method will, is not recommended. Why? Because this will actually allow the pest to have the opportunity to affect your plants. Okay? Because of the openings. Ma. Okay? So what can you do? Simple. Always make sure you have a pair of clean, sanitized cutter. All right? And then try to prune next to the node here as close as possible. Can you see? Okay, and when that do, it's short enough. So the plant will not suffer much. Okay, so this is generally how you guys would need to do pruning. Now, um, just to indicate that for bring jaw, for the eight plants, because it has a widespread canopy, Always ensure that some of the suckers at the base are being removed so that you allow sunlight to actually shine in and your lower leaves will not be affected. And as for plants like the uh, lady's finger, you have to allow it to grow upwards. Okay? Pruning is not recommended. You don't, we don't do pruning down. Okay? You can prune a bit of the leaves, but we don't do hard pruning, okay? And for tomatoes, for some of us growers, um, tend to actually remove a little bit of suckers, okay? This is to encourage more fruits to actually develop, okay? So clear with the pruning part? Now, let me introduce some of the interesting friends of garden. We all have friends, ma. Okay, even the plants also have friends, you know. Okay, let me emphasize three types of my best friends here in the garden. First one is known as the lace wings. Now, this is lace wings, ah, the eggs of the lace wing, as you can see in the photo. It is not lace bud, by the way. Okay, so you can see these eggs virtually almost anywhere. Okay, it lay their eggs on the surface of the leaves, even on metal or wooden structures too. Okay. Sometimes very inconspicuous that we never notice them. But maybe after this, you will start to notice them already. Now what does they do? They, once the eggs hatch, the larva will start to devour the affix or parasitize the affix. So the affix will die already. Affix, by the way, is one of our pests in the garden. Okay. Now the same thing goes for the ladybirds. Ladybirds will also devour uh, pests like ethics or mini bugs. Okay, so these two are my friends. Now the third one is the most important friend of garden. Yes, that's the bees. Okay, we need bees because they are important pollinators. Without them, even if you have flowers, you might not be able to see the fruits at all. Okay, now to ensure that you attract bees, you must make sure that the environment is conducive enough. For people who stay in a high-rise flat where there is strong wind circulation, your pollen of the flower will be very dry and bees also don't come because too strong already. So what can you do? Just make sure you have a structure to protect the plant from the strong wind, okay, so that the pollen is not dry and the bees somehow or other will get their way inside. And if you want to you know, um, conquer the dryness, and the, the other method is actually to have frequent misting of the plant. This is to retain moisture. Now this is pollinating using the natural pollinators. You can actually do a manual pollination. Do you know that? One thing is, method is to use Toothbrush, sorry, a uh, paintbrush. Okay, with this paintbrush, all you need to do is to just brush this into the pollen. 
and making sure that the pollen stick onto the stigma, you will get it fertilized. Another two methods that I would like to share is, let's take this tomato plants for example. Okay, you can gently just shade so that the flower, the pollens will actually start onto the, the, the stigma. Now the key word is gently, okay? You don't shade until the whole thing drops. Then the other method is just simple tweaking. Just use the fingers and just flip gently also. Somehow, uh, this is my favorite method, okay? Just flip and the pollen will get stuck in there. Easy, right? Now enough of the enemies. Let's talk about, sorry, enough of the friends. Let's talk about enemies now. Yes, the pests, okay? Now we have, I have prepared some uh, photos of um, common pests that we uh, face, okay? Apart from the ethics, mini bugs, and skills which we always face, there's another thing called white flies. As you can see for the photos, all right, the eggs is actually in the insect. White flies are actually characterized by the white powdery substance and they're always found at the underside of new leaves. So if you actually manage to flip open your, flip your leaves, you might notice something flying around. That is white flies. Okay? If it doesn't, then it would mean other, other um, disease like powdery mildew. Okay? Then the, ne the other one that I also face is Broad mites. Now, what are they? They are actually microscopic pests that is present everywhere in the soil, especially. Okay, the key word is microscopic. So no, you cannot see them with your naked eye, but you can see the symptoms that is suffering by the plant. Now, over here, I have actually have some slides to show. Is um, affected ones. You can notice how distorted and how stunted the new shoot is versus the young new leaves, okay, normal ones. Now the other one that I'd like to emphasize is the trips. Um, okay, I should ask you this, this question, um, I should say it this way. Have you actually ever noticed the white spots appearing on the leaves of your plants? Now example here you can see is on the brinjal plant, okay, the leaves. Can you see the white spots there? Okay, this is what we call stippling. And the culprit behind, there are two. One is trips and one is spider mites. The spider mite is shown on the upper picture and the trips is actually shown on the lower, uh, lower picture. Okay, these are very small. Uh, between zero, uh, for trips, it's actually about one or two mm. And they always like to move around. So it's very hardly able to catch them. So the difference is to see whether there's any spider webs. If there is, chances is spider mites. Now how do we deal with all these pesky pests? Simple, just do four things, probably. One is to, protect, uh, is to give a appropriate netting or appropriate structure to protect it. So the pest won't come in. Ma. Second thing is to ensure that the plants are actually grown or rather kept in a, in a proper growing condition. I mentioned earlier on, these plants are sun-loving plants. So please don't put them under full shade. Plants not happy. When they're not happy, they will be easily susceptible to pests. Now the other one is physical method, just by basically pruning. Now things like lady's finger, for instance, you have all the spots. This is indicative of a pest. So if it's not affecting a large area, all you need to do is just to prune it, this thing away and throw them appropriately. Now when I say throw them appropriately, because we tend to recycle the leaves in the form of compost, right? We just put at the base. But for this case, as they are affected, try not to do that, okay? Just throw them appropriately inside the bag and throw them away. The last thing, if all methods fail, then we try doing spraying of pesticides. Okay, personally, I would choose organic pesticides because these are edibles, ma, so it's something which we want to eat. Ah. So organic pesticide would include things like white oil or white, uh, white summer oil or neem oil. 
Now these two are petroleum based, so when you spray the entire plant, ensure that you don't do it in the hot, under the hot sun, because this will cause the leaf to scorch. Then the next one is some um, plant extract such as the pyrethrin, which is extract from the chrysanthemum. And the last one is my favorite chemical, it's known as biometrin. Biometrin is an extract from a plant called Sephora. So they will help to deal with this pests such as broad mites and trips, for instance. Basically everything. Okay, so with that, let's go on to the next. Yeah, the one that you like, the Q&A portion. Now, before I move on to the questions, um, I have two questions that um, quite a lot of people actually been asking me. So let me address that first. The first question is, as my lady's fingers plants grow taller, the lower part of the plant do not have any more leaves. Why is this so? Um, I can think of two scenarios. First thing, old age. As the plant grow up, up and away, the lower leaves will slowly die of old age. So that is common, okay? The other one is when the leaves doesn't have, the lower leaves doesn't have enough um, sunlight exposure. So then the slowly the yellow leaves will actually, um, you know, the leaves will actually become yellow. So what you need to do, as I mentioned, is to open up the canopy by removing some of the suckers and then allow the light to filter in. So that will solve the issue. So depending on which scenario that is. Okay. Now the next question, white powdery substance appear on my eggplant leaves. So what is this and how do I avoid getting? Now, as I mentioned earlier, if the white powdery substance appearing on the leaf flies, chances are that it's white flies. So just do the methods which I mentioned. But if this white powdery substance doesn't fly at all, it's actually known as this fungal thing called powdery mildew, okay, due to low light and high humidity. So what you can do, um, you can actually try, if it's not too invasive, try to prune the affected plants and throw them away immediately. If not, you can actually uh, spray the plant with fresh milk, okay. How you do that, do look up you know, gardening resources for the exact um, concoction. So I hope that this is okay. Now, let's see what are the questions that we have. Okay, why flowers tend to drop just before they open? Is it lack of some kind of nutrients? Help. Okay, now flowers tend to drop when they might not receive enough nutrients to boost them up. Okay, remember for when they are actually flowering, they need a lot of energy. So chances is probably we don't in apply enough um, fertilizer, especially the phosphorus and the potassium part. Okay, but uh, when we apply fertilizer, do remember don't apply too much. Less is more. So we can apply in a smaller portion and yet at a more frequent frequency. Okay, so I hope that helps the question, your answer. Okay, next is, how long can an open seed pad last? How can I store it? Okay, um, seed pads, as we all know, all comes with an expiry date, just like our food, ma. okay? So, but once you open, the expiry date is not valid anymore. So normally for tropical seeds, they would last until about say three months. Okay, so as you kept longer, the viability of the seeds will become shorter. So you will find that at the end of three months or four months even, and you you want to sow the seeds, you might realize that the germination rate is not as high as when you first try on. Okay, so if you can try to you know use up your seeds quickly. But if you cannot, you want to store them, you can put them in a, in a closed container and just put them in the fridge. Simple. Okay? Now, the other question I have. Hi, I was wondering if the powdery mildew will affect okra and eggplants as well. 
I tried growing cherry tomatoes and they kept having them. Tried neem oil weekly, but they are quite persistent. As long as there is overcrowding or lack of ventilation. Thanks in advance. Okay, uh, hold on this question first. I, can, I need to answer a bit. Um, sorry, can I have a look at the question? <laughs> okay. Powdery mildew, yes, will affect any plants, regardless whether it's edibles or non-edibles. Okay, it will, as long as due to low light and high humidity. Even cherry tomatoes will also get them. Okay, and uh, it will be even easier to get if you actually water and your water manage to get onto the leaf itself. Okay, neem oil is an oil petroleum based plant. Um, it's not exactly a fungicide. Me powdery mildew is, is due to um, fungus disease. Okay, so um, the organic way of doing is to spray is using fresh milk as I have mentioned. And uh, if you want to increase ventilation, do prune away some of the suckers, okay, or a few shoots, so that you allow light and circulation to pass through. I hope I answer your question. Okay. What do we have? Okay. My okra was growing well, but turned yellow, and drop its leaves after it fruited twice. Even the tiny shoots turn brown. Okay, could it be that it had reached the end of its lifespan? Yeah, semi correct. Yeah, quite correct. In fact, um, plants like others are annuals. Okay, especially yeah, okra, um, tomatoes, eggplants. All these will grow at a certain lifespan. That is why I mean by annual. Once it fruit, you having one to two, maximum three harvests, and that's it. Okay, it will start to deteriorate. So yes, it will start growing. So quickly, if you can, if you have some seed pods or fruits on your plant, and they have matured seeds, do harvest the seed to grow for the new generation, the next generation. Okay. I hope that answer your question. Now, the other one I have, Ooh, okay, how do I get rid of aphids naturally without harming my tomato plants? Okay, aphids, if you can, of course, if you have friends, do, don't change them out. The friends like, you know, the ladybirds, yeah, these are our friends. But if you have a quite of uh, uh, aphids issue, um, which actually, you know, at the, normally at the tips, right, yes. So if you want, you can use um, water to sort of, you know, wash away some of the aphids or use your hand to rub it to get rid of the aphids present. Okay, this is actually one of the physical uh, method of removing aphids. Then we actually move to use neem oil or white summer oil. Okay to bio, bio, bio uh, chemical um, pesticides to actually remove, eliminate whatever aids that's being present in the plant. Okay, so I hope this will answer your questions. What are the best varieties of tomato for Singapore climate? Where are the seeds available? Um, Varieties of tomato here in Singapore, well, basically, cherry tomatoes is one of them. The Vilma is one of them. All these are able to grow in under Singapore climate. Okay? And uh, as I mentioned, if you want to buy the seeds, do find them in our local commercial nurseries. Most of them will actually carry. Either that, or you can actually get them from a reputable seed source. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, my tall okra plant attracts a lot of grasshoppers that devour the leaves. Any tips on keeping them away? Yep. Grasshopper is one pesky pest. Well, you can actually try to 
um, pick them up if you manage to see them. Okay, if you dare, <laughs> because they can be quite leggy, those creatures. Now, but um, back to the point, to protect your plant, it's best to actually have a protective netting or a structure. Okay, that way, the grasshoppers won't come and affect it. Okay, and of course, making sure that your netting, the hole, is not this big. Okay, so if you have so big holes, it's good as not having any netting. So try to use nettings which have smaller holes, like 0.2 mm size, for instance. So that will keep most of the pests away. Okay, but do remember that if you do protective netting, make sure that no pest actually allows to enter when you try to do something to the plant. If not, then wow, the pest will be happily ever after living inside already. Okay. Now, the next question that I have: How to get phosphorus? Blood and bone fertilizers are not available in Singapore. Well, phosphorus, uh, yes, you can actually get it. Actually, you can get it from from the local nurseries. In fact, they are not known as phosphorus, but they are called other brands like you know things like liquid fertilizer such as phosphogen or some of the uh, bone meals you can it actually call by other names or trade names okay so um, you might not find them but in actual fact they are available in fact now uh, if you want to get phosphorus naturally um, you might want to organically you can actually add a little bit of uh, say banana peels for instance okay but making sure when you do such organic ways all right they are buried deep inside the soil so that they don't prevent or attract other pests and uh, how about fish if you actually keep fishes at home you can and you want to change water right so you can extract all those water from the fish and do a little bit of watering okay this will be your source of phosphorus energy, or phosphorus, in fact. Okay? I hope that answered your questions. Okay, the next one. Is it possible to grow tomatoes, ladyfinger, and eggplants indoors near windows? If grow lights are required, what is the intensity required for these plants. Now, first question, is it possible to grow these three plants in your windowsill? My question is, if your windowsill is able to allow the sun to filter in, all right, for at least four hours, then you are good to go. Okay, if not, I would suggest moving on to a much sunnier place. If you want to use grow lights, the intensity you have to check as uh, each grow lights have their own specifications. Okay, um, but if you need to know more, we have that in our garden resources too, so you can just look them up. Okay. Okay, I have one last question. How often do you recommend? adding compost or fertilizer to these plants. Okay, compost is different from mulching. Okay, compost is an organic matter that normally we fall into the soil like a soil conditioner, like a hair conditioner like that. Okay, so you can add as often as you require because compost is biodegradable, it's organic, ma, so it will disintegrate eventually right so you can add in and add in as long as you don't suffocate too much okay so but don't add too more too much also um, one layer is good enough and you can frequently add it say once a fortnight now as for fertilizer i have mentioned before less is more so 
you can add a little bit of fertilizer or a spoonful of fertilizer into the plants, but at a more fre uh, frequency, say um, once, a, once a month, for instance, or once every two weeks. It depends also on the size of the plant. The bigger your plant is, the more food they will need. If it's actually the juvenile stage, once a month is good enough. And how much to add fertilizer? You have to look up for their label specification on the box itself. So I hope this actually answers your queries. And we have come to the end of this webinar. Thank you very much, guys, for the support for attending this um, masterclass series. I really hope that you find this useful, fruitful, and interesting. Okay? If you would like to watch again, it will be put up online in our MPUX SG YouTube channel tomorrow. Okay? And if you would like to find out more about other gardening related matters, do look up in our MPUX website. They have a bunch of information over there. So do look up. Okay? So with that, I wish everyone a happy, good weekend. Take care and stay safe. Goodbye.